Welcome. My name is Jeff Wyma, and I'm a professor of New Testament at Calvin Theological Seminary. And this uh, series of videos will be exegeting or interpreting a rather interesting, although controversial, passage from the New Testament, James 2, 14 to 26. And although there are lots of interesting things that we will learn about just in this passage by its very self, the larger goal of this process is to again illustrate the hermeneutic, the kind of uh, principles for interpretation that ought to control the passage or the reading of any passage of Scripture. First, we begin by hearing what the text says, and we read that then in chapter 2, verses 14 to 26, as follows. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God? Good. But even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Now, this passage has had a controversial history in the church for the simple but rather important reason that James sounds like to many that he's contradicting Paul, especially Paul on the business of faith and its relationship to works. Paul, for example, in Romans 3.28 says, We maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from observing the law. And at first blush, that sounds like it disagrees with verse 24 from our passage in James 2, where he says, you see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. There are a number of examples of people who have struggled with James and drawn, in my mind, wrong conclusions from this passage. For example, we have Luther's approach to this passage. Luther, you know, did not like the letter of James as a whole at all. That's because Luther discovered what he thought was the central teaching of Scripture, the central teaching of the gospel, namely salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And he looked high and he looked low in James to find that teaching, and he couldn't find it anywhere. And so as a result, he, well, he questioned whether it should even be in the Bible, in the canon. And if Luther didn't like James as a whole, he called it actually a, a straw letter, right? It was theologically lightweight and wimpy. It lacked the heart or the substance of the gospel. So if Luther didn't like the letter of James as a whole, he especially didn't like one passage in James, namely the one that we're looking at. And he believed that, that James in this passage not only lacked the gospel, he contradicted Paul. In fact, he says, you have the quote there before you, it, that is the letter of James, is flatly against St. Paul and all the rest of Scripture in ascribing justification to works. In fact, Luther was so sure of himself that you couldn't solve this supposed tension between James and Paul. He said, if anybody could solve it, I'll take off my professor's hat, give it to that person, and let him call me a fool. Well, before we blame Luther for uh, drawing maybe a wrong conclusion from this passage, there are others who have also struggled with it as well. For instance, here's a, uh, a, a, a European scholar who says this. 
the statements of James cannot be brought into harmony with the authentic Paul. And what we confront is not only a tension, but an antithesis. Well, that's pretty strong language, an antithesis. That is, two ideas or two authors that are completely opposed to each other. James Dunn is uh, one of the actually leading New Testament scholars in the world today. He's just recently retired, but he looks at this passage and he sees in it a division, a controversy between two different wings within the early church. He says this, It is obvious then that what is reflected here, that is in James, is a controversy within Christianity between that stream of Jewish Christianity, which was represented by James at Jerusalem on the one hand, and the Gentile churches or Hellenistic Jewish Christians who have been decisively influenced by Paul's teaching on the other. So Dunn looks at our passage and he says, oh, I see what's going on in here. This is the manifestation, the evidence that there was a division in the early church. We have the, the Gentile wing, and that's the Pauline wing, and then you have the Jewish wing, and these two are opposed to each other, and this text is evidence of that division or tension. Another example of how this passage has played an important and controversial role has been in something called the Lordship Salvation Debate. Maybe you've heard about this debate, maybe you haven't. It's been more restricted within the evangelical wing of the church. And the way this debate is usually articulated is this. People ask, is Jesus our Savior or our Lord? Now, in answer to that question, one camp within this debate answers, Jesus is our Savior. And if you fall into that camp, you try to stress the fact that one doesn't have to do anything. There's there's no emphasis on works or deeds. It's all grace and the free nature of grace made possible through faith. And if you belong to another camp, the one we're about to turn to, namely that you believe Jesus is Lord, you accuse the other camp of of an overemphasis on the law, an overemphasis on works or a works righteousness perspective or something that we often call legalism. You can see here one of the proponents from this side. Notice the title of his book. It's absolutely free, right? This is a person who's worried that any talk about works or deeds somehow undermines the free, undeserved nature of God's grace. But there's the other side, the other camp, and they say, no, 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 Jesus is not just our Savior, he's also our Lord. Lord is a term for those in power and authority. The idea that you have to not only just believe in Jesus, but you have to submit your life to Jesus. In other words, you are willing to... um, to allow every aspect of your life to be controlled by the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And so there's an emphasis then on your works, on your deeds. You give evidence of the fact that Jesus is your Lord by the things that you do. And then what do they say about the other camp, the Jesus is Savior folks? They say, well, those people are guilty of what we sometimes call cheap grace or easy believism. So you can see here, I've given four different examples of people or groups of people who've struggled with this passage of James. And so I'm not exaggerating when saying that this passage has had a kind of controversial history within the Christian church. So let's enter into this discussion and As always, we want to approach the passage the proper way, namely following the five hermeneutical or interpretive principles that we have been uh, talking about in the course so far. So the first one, uh, some of you may know, is not the one before you. It actually is the Holy Spirit element. But we've talked before how it is more of a presupposition underlying these other hermeneutical principles rather than the other four that we're about to talk about now that are more objective categories. And so we turn to this more objective category called grammatical, and this is the idea that we need to look at the text in its original language. And because this is a New Testament passage, that means we're looking at it in Greek. 
And we simply can't just cop out and say, it's all Greek to me, and then we just kind of forget about it and move on. No, even if we don't know Greek, or even if we're not a Greek geek, we still have to wrestle with whatever knowledge the original text or language might have for us. And so we have to make sure that we consult the right kind of sources and people who are familiar enough with the language so that we can benefit from these things. Another way to ask the question is, what can I learn about this passage from the Greek text that I can't get just from the English translation alone? So let me give you a bunch of examples of how this, is, this principle, this grammatical principle, is a very important one for beginning to get a good understanding of what's going on in this passage. So we start off already in the first verse with a question, what good is it? In Greek, it's a little phrase, ti ta aphelos. Now, if you did a word study on this, you would find pretty quickly that it is a fixed expression. In other words, that little three-word phrase, ti ta aphelos, regularly occurs together. And whenever it occurs together, it always has the same expected answer, right? The question literally means, what is the good, or what is the benefit, or what is the profit? Those are different English translations for the same Greek phrase. But the answer to the question is always the same, and the answer is nothing. Zero. And you can see examples of that elsewhere in the New Testament, and in writings outside the New Testament. So when James begins his passage by saying, T ta fellows, what is the profit, or what is the benefit... We need to now know that this actually isn't a real question. It isn't like James is saying, I don't know what the answer is going to be. Let's talk about it. Maybe you can help me figure it out. No, no, this is more of a loaded question. It's more of an assertion. What James is about to say is, whatever I'm about to talk about, it's not worth anything. Remember, the answer to this question is always nothing. Now, the first rhetorical question is followed by yet another rhetorical question. Our translation, which comes from the NIV, says, can such faith save him? Actually, the original Greek simply has the definite article, the article the. And this is important because when James talks about the faith here in verse 14b, that means he's not talking about faith in general or faith in the abstract. No, he's talking about a special kind of faith. What kind of faith? Well, the faith that I just mentioned, that is James, in the earlier part of the verse. The earlier part of the verse that says someone claims to have faith but has no works or deeds. And some translations then rightly try to... Well, first of all, there are translations that don't capture that. So you take the King James Version or even the New Revised Standard Version. They translate verse 14b simply as, Can faith save you? Now, if you look at that, wait a minute... That doesn't sound right. I mean, it might sound like James either doesn't know what the answer is or he somehow thinks that faith can't save. Rather, the Greek text is quite clear. He says, can the faith save you? What faith? The faith I just talked about earlier in the verse, namely the kind of faith where somebody says they have faith but has no deeds. Can that kind of faith save you? And so that's why the NIV is right when they translate it with the word not faith but such faith. And a few other translations, I think, are right, too, when they say faith like that or that kind of faith. Now, even those translations that rightly point back to the earlier part of the verse that James is talking about a special kind of faith, a faith that has no works, even the ones who get that right get something else wrong with this verse. And that is because this is, again, a loaded question. You see, in Greek, there are three different ways that you can ask a question. One way in Greek you can ask a question is in a neutral way, where the speaker really doesn't know the answer. So I could say to you, are you enjoying this video series? And I have no idea whether you are or you're not. Your answer might be yes or no. I I really don't know. It's a genuine question. However, I could ask instead a loaded question, a rhetorical question, which I already know and I'm asserting what the answer is. Let's imagine... I know the answer is no. I could say it this way. I would say, you're not enjoying this video presentation, are you? Or I could say a third way, also loaded, a rhetorical question with more of an assertion than a genuine question where the answer is yes. I'm saying, you are enjoying this uh, video presentation, aren't you? So in Greek, you have these three different ways to ask a question. And now you have to go back to verse 14b, and the question is, which one of those three? 
Can such fail them? It's not the neutral way, it's the loaded way, and it's the loaded way that expects the answer to be no. So the best translation is such faith, namely the faith described in the first part of 14a, the kind of faith where somebody says they have faith but has no works, such faith isn't able to save him, is it? So actually the Greek is quite helpful here in telling us that these aren't neutral or genuine questions, as if James is puzzling over the matter. He has no idea whether the answer is yes or no. Instead, James is more asserting something. He's asking a rhetorical or loaded question, and he's asserting to his audience, he's saying, a kind of faith that has no works, that is unable to save. It's a non-saving faith. These are all important truths that the Greek text clearly tells us, which often, if not almost always, are missing in English translation. You do sometimes lose something in translation. Verse 15 starts off in translation, suppose a brother or sister. Actually, the original Greek text starts off with, if a brother or sister is without clothes. A sentence that begins with if is called a conditional sentence. And there's one, two, three kinds of conditional sentences in the Greek language. And this one is a third class condition. And many scholars um, take this third class condition as describing not an actual situation, not a real situation, but more of a hypothetical situation. In fact, that's why the NIV translates it not as if a brother, but rather suppose a brother, right? We're just postulating some hypothetical situation in which a brother or sister is walking around in need and something happens to them. However, this is where a mistake is often made because a third class condition often describes not a hypothetical situation, but a general situation or fairly common situation. And this is important, and we'll talk about it later when we get to the historical context, because if this is read the right way as describing a general situation or a common situation, that means that James is dealing not with something unusual, something rare, something that hardly if ever happens, but rather just the opposite. He's talking about a common problem in his churches where you have brothers or sisters walking around lacking food and clothing and people are ignoring their needs. James does something else in verse 15, which I think is important to notice. He says, suppose a brother or sister. Now, the reason I'm stressing that is because James actually writes or sister. And you might miss that because many Bible translations today, out of a gender inclusive policy, take when a biblical writer writes just brother and then they add, even though it's not in the original text, they add or sister. And the reason they do so is because, with some justification, they assume that when the biblical writer says brother, they include not just the male members of the church, they include all the members of the church, including this, the female, and so they don't want the modern reader to be misled or to draw a wrong conclusion, and so they add or sister. But then, if you have a Bible like that, you might not realize that James actually adds or sister. That's not so common in the New Testament. And the reason James adds or sister, I think, is important because James highlights not only brothers who are in need, but he goes out of his way to also explicitly identify sisters who are in need. And I think this would be uh, important, particularly in a patriarchal culture where women are dependent either on a husband or a father for help and for protection. And so, by mentioning sisters, it highlights the vulnerability of some of the members, the female members of the church, and also how the church is unfortunately neglecting to minister to those who are vulnerable and in need. The Greek again tells us something more that the English doesn't clarify or always say. Another example in verse 15 is the participle, that's what it is technically in the Greek language, the participle lacking, lacking, being derived of daily food. And James uses a tense of the participle here, it's a present tense, that has nothing really to do with time, when it is happening, and has everything to do with emphasis or accent. 
The present tense participle is used when the writer wants to stress something, especially an ongoing or continuous situation. And so this highlights the, the, the problem that James is talking about. Again, he's not just talking about a brother or two, right? A brother or sister who happens once in a blue moon to have a need, but it sounds like he's describing an ongoing continuous situation. There's uh, an ongoing problem of needy people within the family of God, and the church is, unfortunately, neglecting them. The Greek stresses that. Verse 16 is uh, interesting as well. This is the response. This is James describing how some Christians respond to the brother or sister who's lacking uh, clothes and food. And the response is, one way to translate it is, keep warm and well fed. Now, it just so happens that in the Greek language, the form used here for these two verbs can either be something that's called the middle voice or the passive voice. Let's deal with the passive voice first because that, I think, is more easy for us English speakers to understand. When you look at the uh, image you had before that, you can see there the difference between a passive and an active voice. In a passive voice, the subject receives the action. Something is being done to the subject. And so here we talk about how the mouse is being eaten by the cat, right? The mouse isn't doing something, it's being acted upon, right? That's the passive voice. Now, if you translate this verb passively, what you're saying is, be kept warm and be well fed. You're implying that somebody else, other than you poor people, will take care of that. And that could either be God, and this is actually a technical form in the Greek language called the divine passive, God is implied as the agent, even though he's not explicitly stated, or another Christian. But the important point I want you to see is, if it's translated passively, the speaker who's saying these things is blind to the fact that, that they possibly can be that agent by which this needy person is kept warm or well-fed. That's one possible way, reading it as the passive voice. However, it could equally be translated with a middle voice. We, have, we don't need to talk about what the middle voice is other than to tell you that in terms of the subject, the middle voice does the action, just like in the active voice. So the subject is doing whatever the verb is. So if you turn it to the active voice, you have to talk about how the cat is eating, right? The cat is actively doing something. The cat is eating the mouse. And if we translate this response from the Christian community to the needy people as the middle voice, then it would be something like, warm yourselves and feed yourselves. And you see how this involves a greater insult to these poor and needy Christians. Because now, basically, you're not only ignoring them, but you're telling them, you guys take care of the problem yourself, right? Don't be dependent on someone else to help you out of your need. You take care of it yourself. Now, we can't know 100% sure which one James intended because, again, both are possible. I have one scholar here who suggests that the middle is better, but the last part of his quote is important for us to hear. He says, though either voice, whether it's middle or passive, points to the fact that some professed believers are failing to meet the needs of other church members. So it comes out looking bad for the church either way, the middle or the passive, although it might be a little bit more embarrassing for the church with the middle, a little more uncaring and insensitive as they kind of tell these needy people to take care of the problems themselves. Verse 19 has an interesting grammatical point. We read, and they shudder. The they, of course, are the demons. Because James says, you believe that God is one? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. That's a little bit of a wimpy translation, shudder. That just sounds something like that. Actually, the Greek verb thriso uh, is often used in the ancient world in connection with hair. And we talk about people's hair standing on the ends of their head or animals with their hair bristling up high. Why? When they're afraid, right? When they're under some kind of danger. And so this is actually a quite strong verb that is used Right? It refers to a kind of uncontrollable, uncontainable, violent shaking from fear and terror. So the image is a lot more vivid, I think, in the Greek than it is in the English. 
you can see the noun that comes from the same verb, frike, is where we get our English word fright. Frike, fright. It's, it's the same root. And this verb also occurs in magical papyri. What are magical papyri? Well, they're papyri. That means they're written on papyrus paper. That means they're likely discovered in Egypt. It's one of the few places where these kind of texts can survive. And they're magical papyri. Because uh, in the ancient world, people were very superstitious. They believed there were all kinds of spirits and deities and beings gathering around. And, and they tried to control them. And, and one way to try to get rid of the evil spirits is you try to exercise them. You cast them out. And this verb occurs many times in those texts and describes the reaction of demons supposedly to that verb. The idea of, of responding in terror or in fright. If we want another example, we can turn to, of course, the Gospels, where a number of occasions Jesus cast out demons, and we see the response. The one there before you is a good one from Mark 1, where we read, The evil spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. And so again, and they shudder, uh, at least in my mind in English, sounds a little bit wimpy. It kind of loses the punch or the force of the original Greek text. Something is lost in translation. In verse 20, 20b, there is a clever pun, right? A pun is difficult to pick up when you go from one language to another. I have a pun here in English, right? Frog parking only, all others will be towed. Well, it's only funny, it's only humorous if you, if you recognize, wait a minute, a toad and a frog, okay, they go together. And then, of course, the English word to tow, right, to tow a vehicle, right, you can put it in the past tense, towed, it's spelled differently, but it sounds the same. So there, there's kind of a clever pun there, frog parking only, all others will be towed. Well, James does a similar kind of pun, a clever word play, and he does it here in verse 20b, where in Greek he uses the word arge. Now, the word arge is made up from the same word that the word work comes from, except you have an alpha added to it, which negates it. And it's hard to capture it in English. Uh, here's one possible way to do it. It would go like this. Faith without works does not work. You can catch a little bit. Faith without works does not work. And I know that James was intending this pun because not only is the meaning itself kind of clever, but the word for work is put up right beside the word for useless, right? The word from which work uh, is derived. So those two words are put right beside each other in order for the reader not to miss the pun. Now, you might be saying to yourself, big deal, how does that help me interpret the passage? Well, I think there are two significances to this, rhetorically or persuasively. Remember, James is writing first and foremost to an audience in his day, and he's trying to convince them of something. He's trying to persuade them of something. And how does that help him? Well, a pun, first of all, makes his readers favorably disposed to him, right? You're kind of impressed by his ability and clever writing skill, and so you just kind of like him, and you're more likely to accept, therefore, what he's saying. And then secondly, with a pun, it forces you to kind of slow down and say, wait a minute, did I get that right? And you look more carefully at what is actually said. And so there's greater emphasis to the claim that is made, which is at the heart of his argument, namely that faith without works does not work, right? The kind of faith that doesn't have any works in James' mind doesn't work. It's useless. It's no good. So rhetorically, the pun actually is helpful on two levels. Verse 21, we meet another kind of question, and we again say, now what kind of question is this? Is it a neutral question in which the speaker isn't sure? Yes, no, maybe. Or is it one of those loaded questions, one of those rhetorical questions where the speaker is asserting something more than genuinely asking something? And the answer is, it's not the neutral question. It's one of those rhetorical loaded ones. But unlike 14b, where the answer was clearly no, here the answer is clearly yes. Right? The structure in the Greek clearly shows that the answer is yes. And so the question that James asked, Was Abraham our father considered righteous when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? James is asserting, not asking, he's asserting that, that yes, he was. Yes, he was. And that's important for you to know if you're going to properly interpret this passage. 
The next verse, verse 22, has two things that are worthy of note. And that is, first, that James uses the plural actions. Sometimes we could translate it deeds or works. And then the second thing, I'll explain the significance of the first thing in a second. But the second thing is the verb, were working. This is a rarer, more unusual form of the verb that again stresses the ongoing or continuous nature of the action. So what are these two features, the plural actions and the unique or rare form of the verb mean? Well, it means that James, even though he's referring to the one act of Abraham offering Isaac on the altar, he must not be thinking only of that one act. He instead, as he says in verse 22, is thinking of Abraham's actions, the actions throughout Abraham's life that were constantly working together with his deeds. Another important exegetical point. Word order is important. Now, in English, at least for correct English grammar, prepositional phrases are usually at the end of a sentence. That's where they normally belong. But in Greek, word order doesn't matter unless you want to emphasize something. And so James puts some keywords in the very front of a sentence for emphasis. So the word order in verse 24 reads more literally like this. You see that out of works is justified a person and not out of faith alone. Now, that would be bad English, right? In English, your translation would take the subject, a person. You would, it would go something like this. You see a person is justified out of works. But James put out of works in the front of the sentence. Why? Because he's stressing that works or deeds are evidence of a special saving faith. James' emphasis on works here are part, is part of his um, overriding message or theme for this passage. That's lost in the English translation. We have yet another question in verse 25. And again, we ask ourselves, neutral question or loaded one? And again, it's the loaded question. And also like Abraham's question, this one too with Rahab expects the answer yes. And so when James says, was Rahab the prostitute considered righteous? for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. And the Greek says very clearly, yes, she was. James is again not asking as much as he is asserting this to be the truth. Well, we've seen in a variety of important ways how grammar makes a difference how the Greek text tells us important information about what the author was thinking and intending and meaning. And that's why these are all good examples of that principle of interpretation that we can call grammatical. Well, we'll take a break before we turn our attention to the next hermeneutical principle, and I look forward to hearing and speaking with you about that.